Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Salted Hash. I'm your host, Steve Reagan with CSO Online. Joining me today is Michael Nadeau, my senior editor, and we're going to talk about 2018 predictions. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Michael, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Steve? It's good to have you back in the studio with me. I'm doing good. It's been a long week. This yes, is, it is. Uh, how many episodes is this now, Chris? Five, six this week? Five, yeah. It's been five episodes this week, so it's been rather busy. In fact, we've seen each other in the hallways in passing, but we haven't even really actually talked until today, no. have we? <laughs> so we're going to be talking about predictions for 2018 it's it's kind of a, a running gag in the security industry everybody's got predictions for you know what's going to happen at the end of the year and, and they always project what's going on and typically they follow one of two paths either it's something completely off the rails that's never going to happen or it's a well x happened in 2017 so x is going to get worse in 2018 and if any little thing happens then suddenly we're right but you've come up with uh, quite a few of them that I actually, not only do I think they make sense, I, I really do actually, I like the way you outlined them out. And I thought we could go through them today, if that's okay, okay with you. Sure. Um, one of the first things is that uh, many, if not most, of the U.S. companies are not going to meet uh, GDPR compliance by the deadline. But will that matter? It might not. Uh to, to back up a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. the, the GDPR requirements are an EU regulation. This is a general data privacy regulation that goes into effect in May of 2018. And uh, it's, they're designed to protect the privacy of EU citizens. So any, any company that, that does not have data on EU citizens doesn't have to worry about this. But if you do have data on EU citizens, it, it, is, a, it is an issue. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, most U.S. companies are not expected to be compliant by the May deadline, and it might not matter. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not, it's, it, you're, you're not going to be audited for compliance. Mm -hmm. But if you have a breach and you were not in compliance, then, then you're subject to a fine. Uh, however, uh, the, the general consensus is that if you can show an honest effort to meet compliance, uh, it, the, the fine won't be so bad. They'll take that into consideration. But the important thing to remember there is to document. Document what you're doing. So also, um, and, and I guess if you're, if you're found out of compliance and you had a breach, it really only hits you, though, if you've exposed data that belongs to a person in the EU. Right. right? That's the, the really big thing. So Companies here in the U.S., if they keep their documentation and everything like that, I mean, we're still not fixing the overall problem, which is baseline security and things like that mm -hmm. to where, you know, these breaches are still happening. And right. And the, the data is not being protected when it's stored or even actually being transferred or, or what have you. So I guess between you and I and everybody watching this video right now, do you think GDPR is actually going to be worth it, or is this just another regula regulation checkbox that's going to be? E yes, it's worth it, and and because a lot of other uh, government organizations outside of the EU are looking at this as a model. Mm -hmm. You're seeing some states like California and New York now having their own uh, privacy standards, and they and they might implement something that's similar. So it, it, if if you you're you're doing business overseas uh, or, or across the U.S., it, it's a good idea to, to pay attention to these regulations because they really are considered a good template for, for protecting privacy. So if the states then start adopting this down to their scale and, and start looking at it, do you think then that's going to be more incentive for people to start catching on to this? Because right now the biggest roadblock, correct me if I'm wrong, is the fact that, well, I don't do any business in the EU, so I don't, need, I don't have to be worried about this. Not realizing that unintentionally you could have EU citizen data and find yourself afoul of this law without even realizing it. Well, when it comes to security, companies aren't known for being proactive. So I, th I think a lot of companies, if they don't have to deal with it right now, they're not going to deal with it right now. They're, they're going to wait until there's, there's a reason to do it. 
Um, and you may have people in, in an organization that are kind of promoting this and, and might be doing stuff in the background to get ready for it. But I, I, don't, I, don't, see, I don't see a huge uh, investment in, in an effort uh, unless, unless it's necessary. <clears throat> so sticking with this as a topic, do you think uh, we're going to see somebody made an example of for this regulation? Yes, and there, there are two schools of thoughts on, on this. Uh, I've heard people say, well, they're not going to go after a U.S. company. They're going to go after somebody in the EU and make an example of, the, of them. But I've also heard, and I, I've heard this from, from people who are uh, specifically from a privacy uh, lawyer who who's works in this area, say that, oh, yeah, they're definitely going after a U.S. company early on. And he said, it, and it won't be a small company. And the inference there was it was going to be somebody like a Google or a Facebook. So if you're a, a mid, mid-sized company or a large company without a huge uh, uh, exposure f- with, with, with EU data, you probably don't have to worry about being one of the, one of, one of the early offenders that they go after. But if, if, you're, uh, if you've, you've got a huge presence, um, you, you have, a, you have a, a breach that's significant, uh, I, I'd worry about uh, getting, getting fined. So let's shift gears a little bit, move towards um, another one of the predictions you outlined here, and that was the decline of password-only authentication mm-hmm. is going to accelerate. And I agree with you completely. In fact, just uh, yesterday I was talking about this with somebody else. And I think Equif- uh, Equifax is going to be the catalyst for mm-hmm. a lot of, of authentication, identification changes. And uh, you, you tell, me, tell me your thoughts on this. You actually outlined quite a few of them. Right. Well, uh, I, I think the Equifax and the Anthem breaches really raised a, a lot of awareness among the, the general public about about how exposed their data is. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're still very confused about how how to go about protecting it. And I, you know, I've I've been doing some writing on this, and I've spoken to a lot of security professionals who are telling me, you know, all my neighbors, my family, my friends are all asking me about this now. Um, and so. Uh, um, I think the the, the, their, the education level there is is slowly rising, and uh, uh, and also the awareness among organizations that are exposed that have a high degree of liability, that awareness is is rising. I've you know I've do business with a number of different uh, institutions, financial institutions for retirement and that sort of thing. And I've been getting a lot of notices. Hey, we're we're doing this two two FA now and yep. uh, two factor authentication, uh, and so look look for a notice. Uh, and that's been within the last last couple of months, which is great. I was really surprised at <clears throat> excuse me at the the outreach I got from a couple of the the financial mm-hmm. institutions I deal with. In the aftermath of the Equifax breach, you know, like, hey, this happened. We don't know if you were involved. Odds are you were. Here are mm-hmm. some steps you need to take. Like, they were completely unrelated to, you know, the actual breach itself. But here they are reaching out to us. And, again, one of the options they were stressing to me is two-factor and second-factor mm-hmm. authentication. Here's how, you know, we're, we're going to change the cards you're working with right now. Mm-hmm. Here's how we're changing the apps. And I think by the end of 2018, actually – it's going to be commonplace for pretty much everybody to, at the very least, use SMS as a mm-hmm. second factor yes. for banking and high-value uh, applications. I I hesitate, though, to say that we'll see like a dramatic change in authentication. The password's never going away. We're always mm-hmm. going to have it. But what do you think? Do you think Apple is going to, once again, be responsible for changing habits like they were with the use of fingerprint and touch ID, or do you think the innovation on that front is going to come from somewhere else? I think it's going to come from somewhere else. The problem with with biometrics, face, and ID is if that's compromised and it can be compromised, you can't change it. So uh, I I think what's going to rise in in significance next year is risk-based authentication. And this is very similar to what the credit card companies have been doing for a decade. Mm -hmm. Where where they're they're monitoring transactions and looking for patterns that that indicate some kind of fraud, uh, so you're going to see companies implement this in, on their on their online services. Where if if for example uh, uh, for example if if uh, 
uh, you know, I, I do something from my, my, my home computer uh, in the morning, and then you know, 20 minutes later, uh, somebody tries to do something else on that service from Europe, they're going to be able to say, hey, yeah. this, this doesn't look right. Yeah. There used to be a company I, I did plenty of inter- interviews with years ago, and um, I can't remember the name of them now. But what they did was they sold the technology that banks used to where, like, they could tell the difference between you logging into your account and anyone mm-hmm. else because you've established, like, these patterns and mm-hmm. micro patterns that go yeah. into how you're yeah and this was 2005 2006 yeah. i mean it was yeah and further down the road you combine that risk based authentication with behavioral biometrics and then you have something that's uh, not foolproof but bordering on it yeah but it's, it's yeah. going to be damn hard to beat you know yeah so let's let's move forward a little bit and we'll talk about um spa- state sponsored attacks mm-hmm. i I don't know. I, whenever I hear APT and state nation states and everything mm-hmm. like this, I get I get twitchy because nine times out of ten, the person targeting your network is not North Korea, it's no. not China. You no. know, it's it's a bored kid in his basement. But the threat from such actors is very real, and it's it's grown over the mm-hmm. last year or so. So, where do you think this is going to head next year? I I think I. First of all, you, you've got the, the, the states that are the bad actors are, are heavily sanctioned right now. Yeah. And if, if they, they, there's really no consequence for them to, to attempt a, a, you know, some kind of a cyber attack, some kind of disruption, uh, what else are they going to do? I mean, they've they're, uh, already been sanctioned as much as is, is, is likely. So they're going to keep pushing the envelope there. And at some point, the... Uh, they're going to step over the line where where somebody needs feels the need to retaliate. Yep. And whether that'll be in the real world or in 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 the uh, online, who knows? But, there was a uh, conversation I was having yesterday about similar lines mm-hmm. on this topic, and um, the the big fear is uh, digital turning kinetic, and mm-hmm. that would be you know, let's say. A state actor somewhere launches a uh, an attack somewhere online, and that ends up being considered a military act. And now you've got actual troops on the ground moving in. Mm-hmm. I think before the decade is out, we will probably see that yeah. in some way or uh, some shape. Yeah. But when it comes to um, the indictments here lately, we've mm-hmm. seen in the news a number of nation states having their uh, citizens indicted by the U.S. for hacking and other things. What do you think of that? Um, you know, I, I was I was at an event uh, where a number of people in in the, the 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 national security agencies were talking about that. They seemed to think it was a very positive, uh, a very positive thing. Uh, the 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 fact is the the chances of those those people being uh, extradited to the U.S. is is slim to none. Yeah, but uh, it it is they do feel like it's a deterrent. You know, if if uh, to the to the people involved that that they could get indicted, it's it's it, it is a deterrent. There was a couple of different researchers who have a past with the government, and they made a a point that I think is always worth considering is the fact that. The, the tables could be turned on us, and therefore you'll have U.S. actors who have done something under orders mm-hmm. or what have you. They'll take a trip to Europe and get arrested the minute they walk off the plane because right. they ended up in the wrong country or something. I think that's a concern. It, it, it worries me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have plenty of friends I would hate to see that happen to. But I think I, I can see why it would be a big f- big thing for morale and why most of the, mm-hmm. those at that conference thought it was a good idea because it does show that they're doing something and they, they're able to find out who they are through a number of means, not just attribution on the, the network side, but also probably physical assets were mm-hmm. brought into play as well. When it, <clears throat> when it comes down to it, though, do you think that while it, it helps morale, do you think these indictments are ultimately just a gesture or do you think there's more to it? I, I think it's it's 
just one one piece of 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 what they're trying to do. It's it's they're doing what um, you know they they can't directly counter it without consequence. So this is one thing that they can do that could have an effect. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff going on on in the background that we don't know about too. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Let's uh, roll forward, keep it moving, keep it moving. I've got a new refrigerator at home, and I used to always make this joke. One day, my refrigerator is going to be tied to a botnet, mm -hmm. and somebody's going to say, is your refrigerator running? It's attacking me. Please tell it to stop. <laughs> and I always thought that was a funny joke, but now it's a reality. It's mm -hmm. a legitimate concern. And over the last two years, not just 2017, but even 2016 as well, IoT has been a a serious pain in the backside for a lot of administrators because trying to get that stuff under control on your network or actually even determining where it is mm -hmm. on your network, I think is, is much easier said than done. So what do you think? Do you think we're going to see more or less problems with that? I, I think we're going to see more. Uh, and a lot of this is, uh, there's a lot of ominous activity going on right now. The discovery of uh, the Reaper Botnet, which is uh, estimated to have a million devices under mm -hmm. its control. Nobody knows what the intent is of the, of the people who control those. Um, there, there's a there's at least three botnet kits out there that are re that are responsible for for uh, infecting up to over a million devices a month. That you can just go, uh, somebody can go out and just buy these kits and and it's have their own a lot botnet. of computers. Um, and right now, what, what you're seeing are people building their infrastructure to, to launch some kind of an attack or to, or to launch spam or, or whatever. Um, and you know, they're, they're getting their command and control uh, in place and, and all that. And I think in 2018, you're going to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of actors who have built these, this infrastructure start to use it. And, and that's, that's going to be kind of, that's gonna result in some kind of reaction. So do you think when they, they finally start doing this, they're going to take advantage of like the automated aspect of some of these kits? Or do you think that we're going to see another manual attack like um, uh, a few of the other ones? Uh, uh, Petya, I think, comes to mind, was uh, more finger pushing than automated. I, I, I think that the the value of the botnet in, to a large degree is is the, autom the automation it, it, that you can put mm -hmm. in place. Uh, we're, we're starting to see uh, 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 bad actors use use uh, machine learning now to help automate processes. So you combine that with a botnet, and you you've got a serious problem. So, so sticking to that, uh, you know, you are correct. Criminals are you know automating where they can. Mm -hmm. Do you think then then that's going to Pitch forward to the enterprise, or you think that uh, you know next year I'll probably see less drive for that and push towards something else. Automation seems to be the uh, technology or buzz of the the week now for some enterprise users. Do you think that's going to stay, or is it going to go away? Uh, I, I think you're going to see automation uh, increase. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what what you're seeing is is it's a lot of a lot of companies are using it now out of necessity. Because uh, the, uh, you, you've got, you know, at least a perceived shortage of, of security talent, so they're looking for for force multipliers, and automation is a force force multiplier. Uh, but they're implementing it for specific tasks where they expect to have the most success. Uh, as they get confident in in implementing those, uh, automating those tasks, uh, they're, they're going to start. You know, spreading the footprint of, of what they're doing with automation. So, what do you think? Uh, tying this into security, then, do you think it's going to enhance and augment what the staff is doing for security, or do you think automation is going to replace it, or in some cases, make it worse? I think it's 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 augment augmentation. Um, where you, where you're seeing it having having an effect is is being able to identify real versus w versus uh, you know non significant events. Um, and so, so you, you're able to focus your people on the on the on the events that are most likely a threat. Yeah. So, to to kind of wind down a little bit and wrap this up, we have um, 
One of the, the, the constant stories that's been around, at least for the last six, seven months, has been the issue of trust mm-hmm. in our, not just our, our the security community as a whole, but just across the industry itself, because you've got the Kaspersky thing, mm-hmm. and that's still playing out. That's, that's nowhere near done. You've got, uh, you know... Vendors and uh, actually, let's just back up. You, you've got the Kaspersky thing that's playing out, but then on another level, you've got personal and professional trust. We have a company that literally paid somebody to go away, and then mm-hmm. you know after the the data breach was disclosed, they they gave them some hush money and then covered it up and kept it from regulators. That's right. like the ultimate no no when it comes mm-hmm. to trust. So we've got that kind of problem and everything else. Is trust dead, do you think? Is it going to come back? Is there a way to bounce back, or is this just the new norm? Trust is in decline, that's, that's for sure. How, if, if you don't, uh, companies don't, don't know uh, what, what their level of risk is because you know, they've, they've, got, they've got software providers, they've got service providers, they've got, they've got supply chain partners. They don't know what, what the risk is there and all those areas, you know, is it, does somebody have a back door into, into one of their supplier systems mm-hmm. that they don't know about? So, that, they, so they, don't, they don't trust the people that they're working with. The, that results in customers not trusting them. Yep. So That's, that's what I was going to ask is that translate down to the customer, and it does. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, look at what, going back a few years, look at Target. I mean, it was a supply chain problem mm-hmm. right then and there, and that led to a whole mess of complications, but it still ultimately came down to it was – not knowing the risks associated with the mm-hmm. the stuff you've got going on. So thank you for coming out and hanging out with me. I really do appreciate that. Uh, any final thoughts for what you think is going to happen next year? Uh, just to, to, to continue on, on the trust theme, uh-huh. uh, because I think that cuts across everything that we've talked about. Uh, I think what's, what's happening in, in, the, in the security landscape today is making trust uh, an asset, a commodity for companies that, that – can can maintain it and build it. So uh, if if you've you've been able to you know reasonably protect against threats, respond appropriately if something does occur, then that that's in some ways going to be money in the bank for for a company. Good point. Good point. So once again, thanks for coming out. Thanks for watching. My name's Steve Reagan. This has been Salted Hash. We'll check in with you next week. See you soon. 